Hey guys, Guy Guys here. Well, it's time once again for another video covering Gundam Sentinel. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, welcome. I'll have a link down in the description that'll take you to part one. As for this video, I'm going to be giving only a short recap of the story so far, as right now we're still kind of right in the beginning. Gundam Sentinel, a story written by Masaya Takahashi, is one of the most popular Universal Century side stories of all time. However, due to the complicated legal nature behind this tale, Gundam Sentinel has never been given an animated version by Sunrise, the company behind the Gundam franchise. In my previous video, diving into this book, we were introduced to the two rival factions fighting each other in the aftermath of Zeta Gundam's Grip's War, the New Decides, a group of fanatical followers of the Titans, and the Earth Federation's Task Force Alpha, a misfit group of rejects and washouts from the Federation forces sent to eliminate them, with one side possessing skilled pilots and warriors, and the other side with technological superiority, both sides must use their quick wits and intelligence as the two sides fight for survival. All throughout this, Ryu Roots, a cocky and arrogant mobile suit pilot, is given control of the experimental and highly advanced S Gundam, a weapon that'll hopefully turn the tide of this conflict. With Ryu not knowing the secrets behind the mysterious system within his mobile suit, Ryu and his allies fly off to Peizun to take on these fanatics and hopefully put an end to their dark plans. With the heroes landing their first victory on the enemy, the battle for the asteroid of Peizun now escalates further, as more forces begin to make their move. Now, let's continue our journey into Gundam Sentinel with Part 2. All images and characters are owned by the respective companies and creators. Chapter 4 So, with the Solar Collector satellite destroyed and the new decides losing one of its major producers of energy, our villains begin to shore up their defenses, preparing for an imminent attack. And with Task Force Alpha's first mission being a success, our heroes receive some good news. An entire fleet of Federation warships has departed for Peizun to aid them. This fleet is even being led by Commander Brian Ayano. This man holds an important role within the relationships of our heroes. Brian Ayano is actually the professor and mentor to Commander Eton Heathrow, the captain of the Pegasus III and Task Force Alpha's mothership. Being a prominent member within the Federation forces, Ayano has volunteered to lead the mission in hopes of hopefully bringing this conflict to a close. As Neo Zeon's invasion of Earth is now underway and the Federation requires more support in order to stop them, the Peizun asteroid threat must be eliminated as soon as possible. Our chapter opens up once again at the Penta Orbital Relay Station. A young officer has been tasked with ensuring the transfer of a large, mysterious crate to the cruiser Bull Run. He does not know what this crate holds, only that it is simply marked by a term in the manifest as the G equipment. The fleet that is preparing to head to Peizun is comprised of several large vessels, two Magellan Kais, eight Solomus Kais, two Columbus Kai carriers, and six standard Columbus carriers. And at the head of this entire formation, the mobile suit hangar bay equipped Magellan class warship Bull Run. We cut to the inside of the ship, where we're given a look at Aeono and what exactly it is he's going through. In the smoldering confines of his ship, Aeono reminisces about a conversation he had had with a man he'd met on the moon. You see, strangely, Aeono had seemed to have met with a member of the Instructor Corps just a few days before the uprising on Peizun broke out. In this talk, Aeono explains his beliefs that Peizun should surrender before all this boils over. But the man sitting across from him begs to differ and with a few choice words, Ayano begins to hear him out. They're not doing this to spite them. The new decides are doing this as a sacrificial act for the sake of the Earth and the Earthnoids who live there. Ayano begins to realize what it is they're hoping to achieve, and as the stranger's words continue to shed light on him, he begins to feel the same way as he does. The final words of this stranger ending their conversation with one final hint of what the new decides are planning. Establishing a political power on the moon, the man says, Tosh Cray aspires to do more than just that. We cut to our heroes in Task Force Alpha running another training exercise. In this test, Stoll Mannings hopes to improve the squad coordination skills of Ryu, who, although succeeded in his previous mission, did so with no ability to remain as a team with his wingmen. As he and the others line up in their suits, Stoll gives them the orders to alter their flight formation. However, Ryu still isn't having it. This leads to a slip up in their timing, and Ryu is once again called out for it. Stoll tells him that he should just quit. He's a shit pilot and he doesn't belong here. But as he berates him, he says the one thing you really shouldn't say to Ryu. He tells him that if he dies in battle, 
he's not going to be sending a letter of condolence to his parents. Rather, he's going to be sending a letter telling them that he got his entire fleet killed all because he's acting like a moron. Now, if you recall, Ryu's parents are both dead. One thing leads to another, and Ryu actually challenges him to a mobile suit duel, with Mennings accepting and asking him to make sure he doesn't piss his pants again like last time. We cut to the exercise a few moments later, and Mannings is commanding his own suit, a Nero trainer type. Both he and the S Gundam have been equipped with paintball guns. As they fight though, Ryu is getting put in his place. He's getting frustrated. He can't find the Nero. It's strange. The S Gundam is a much more advanced machine, yet Stoll's little grunt suit can't be found. Suddenly, the S Gundam gets shot in the leg, the Nero trainer managing to land a hit on him from behind. Before the S Gundam can even manage to turn itself around, Manning says one, landing a perfect paintball shot on the S Gundam's cockpit. With Ryu beaten, he demands a rematch. With Stoll himself noticing something else about Ryu as he asks, he asks him to give him another chance. Stoll is starting to see something about Ryu change. He's not lashing out at him. Stoll recognizes it before Ryu even realizes it himself. He wants to improve. His tone says it all. We cut ahead to two days later and the reinforcement fleet from Penta has left the Federation's territory. As they break free from the Federation's communications range, the moment of truth reveals itself. Aeono's crew have loaded their secret package, and all those on board their flagship are loyal to him. Aeono unveils his own plan. They will no longer be accepting communications from Federation Command. From this point on, the Bull Run shall be joining forces with the new decides. He believes their cause is righteous. Earth belongs to the Earthnoids. The fact that the colonies have gained so much from the fall of the Titans and now enforce their own laws upon the Federation is just an insult to them. He can't abide the thought that this has left the Earth a degenerated puppet for them to manipulate. But he asks to take note. He does not wish to revolt against the Federation or its military. What he wants is for the Earth Federation to fight for Mother Earth. The One Year War should have opened their eyes to the truth that the Space Noids, their cause, is not a righteous one. For the only cause that is truly righteous is their own. He gives those who wish to leave the ability to return to Penta if they wish to. They have 12 hours to make up their minds. As Aeono's bridge applauds him, we turn over to the rest of the fleet. What should they do? Was he serious? But as the calls came in, they all realized he wasn't bluffing. And with Aeono's status as head of the Federation Forces Officers Academy, with many of the men in the fleet being students of his, Aeono himself gains more and more men in his fleet who were willing to join him. In the end, after this decade, Declaration, only two vessels left the fleet to return to Earth. The Federation government, upon learning this, as you'd expect, went into utter chaos. Task Force Alpha, led by Heathrow and the others, receive a new order. Orders that make Heathrow shake in his seat. Aeono has betrayed them. The Federation is hoping to stop him before he makes it to Pezun. And if they succeed in defeating the new decides, they'll still be able to send those combined forces to deal with him. But this idea isn't really going to go well for them. You see, Aeono's fleet was designated the ex-dispatch fleet. They were part of three groups that would have been sent to handle this uprising. While Aeono was making his declaration, two more fleets were preparing to launch at Penta, the Y and Z dispatch fleets. Once they learned that Aeono had chosen to join the enemy, the Federation pretty much lost full control over them as well. This was it for them. The Federation couldn't prevent a war between the Aeug and the Titans from breaking out, and now it was happening all over again. We cut to Tosh Cray and Brave Cod and another new decides officer, this one going by the name of Drake. The man is imploring to his superiors that he wishes to launch a sneak attack on the enemy. He has a plan in place, he just needs an observation vessel to make it work. Drake's plan is to operate Peizun's main cannon manually, using the observation ship to sneak into the enemy's attack path into the Peizun debris cluster and operate the cannon himself. However, Tosh believes it's a foolish move. They can't split up their troops with how few of them there are. Ever since the Federation ceased contact with Peizun and jammed all their comms, they haven't been able to properly get a proper grip on what the battlefield is like out there. They know they sent their inside man to try and convince Aeono to join them, but they themselves aren't aware that the man has betrayed his forces already. They just hope that this would buy them some time. The new decides at this moment only know that Aeono's fleet has been sent to actually retake the asteroid, and Tosh, Cray, and Brave both see it as an opportunity for the weaker men to start to unfortunately begin surrendering. Tosh and Brave deny the man his orders. They can't split up. When the man leaves, Tosh makes note that the men are beginning to lose their will to fight, Drake included. They need to keep their eyes peeled and maintain discipline. 
and with Drake, Tosh Cray and Josh Offshore will make an example out of him. As their conversation pivots, Tosh has an idea for the next stage of their plan. Once their forces escape, and once the enemy takes control of the asteroid, they'll use Drake as their decoy to cover their rears as they prepare for the final stage of Tosh Cray's own plan he's been developing. Brave, however, worries this plan could have loopholes, but Tosh reassures him that this will ensure that they end up using all of their fighting strength that Paizun has managed to offer them. They have one final secret card to play in the defense of this place. Brave's real worry, however, doesn't rest in the asteroid itself, rather their next staging area, Ayers City. They sent in their Agent Satomi to establish communications with them, and now their hope is that he can get them the alliance that they need. We cut to Task Force Alpha on the opposite side of the Paizun perimeter. They've received a transmission from a fleet that's been sent to aid them from the moon. It appears they've lost sight of Aeono's forces. They've changed their flight path. All they can do now is form up with the lunar fleet to commence the attack on Paizun now. Heathrow, through our radiant, can't help but worry though. If the lunar forces have lost sight of Aeono, then what if during the battle they get ambushed? The Federation is still hoping to settle this whole conflict diplomatically. These worries come to the forefront when they receive an emergency distress call. From side 4, Ayug vessels were attacked and were forced to retreat to side 5 for repairs. Throughout them learning this, they have no clue where Aeono is heading. The next day, the mission begins. The Pegasus 3 readies its 9 mobile suits, the S yes Gundam, the 2 Zeta Pluses, the 3 Faz units, and the rest of their Neros. Their mission is to take control of Peizun's main starport. Ryu will be launching first with the Zeta Plus duo, and Crypt's Faz team will follow with the Neros. As Ryu and Crypt bicker about who's going first, with Tex West himself worrying about the fact that this mission sounds like a repeat of their first attack, Ryu and Shin are understandably, you guessed it, punched in the face. The Nero commander, named Chung, hates the way they're acting. He can't believe such morons are leading the strike. He says that if he hears them whine about it again, he's throwing them out into space. Mannings tries to calm everyone down, but as usual, the entire briefing room is soon up in arms. Before the fight between them even breaks out though, the alarms begin to sound. The attack is about to begin. Task Force Alpha and the Lunar Fleet have made contact with Paizun once more. The two sides exchanging fire as the two combined fleets engage the asteroid in a massive two-pronged attack. As the cannons from the Pegasus 3 fire, the Faz Squadron launches from the catapults, intercepting missiles as Paizun attempts to bombard them from afar. As the missile strikes thin out, the three Faz units push on towards the base, with Ryu and his Zeta Plus wingmen launching from the Pegasus 3's catapult in mobile suit mode. As they enter the combat zone, Ryu can't help but feel uneasy. It's odd. The Faz Squadron has cleared the path so easily. There's nothing trying to attack the S Gundam as it enters the battlefield. As Ryu looks at his sensors, he can see it. Within a split second, a striking beam of plasma almost clips his suit from the right. As Ryu dodges it, he can see them. The enemy has arrived. Tex tries to tell him to continue on to Paizun, but it's too late. A series of rapid-fire beam shots rip by, tearing one of the Neros to pieces as the squadron from behind them gets blasted from afar. Ryu sees them. He can see where the shots are coming from. As the others try to tell him to stay in formation, Ryu ignores them. He blasts off towards the source of the beam energy attacks. As he rockets towards the source of them, Josh Offshore can see the mobile suit approaching. Seems the one who destroyed their satellite earlier was a Gundam. As Josh closes the distance, beam shots from the S Gundam's waste cannons fire at him. He dodges them as he climbs, with Ryu cursing Josh, calling him a weakling. Ryu can't help but sense his opponent though. He's skilled in combat, very skilled, but his suit is nothing compared to his own. As the S Gundam gives chase, Offshore can sense him too. He can tell he's a rookie. He feels relieved as he makes the realization. He laughs. It doesn't matter that it's a Gundam. Based on the way that Ryu is flying, he doesn't have the right to decide who's weak. He then fires his machine gun. Zeku Aiza's weapon tears a hail of shrapnel across the S Gundam's chest. Ryu isn't hurt though, but the S Gundam is telling him over and over again to leave. He has to retreat, but Ryu isn't listening to the machine's pleas. The S Gundam's monitor is displaying strange words on his screen over and over again repeatedly. Painful, agony, suffering, unhappy, noise, annoying, unhappy. Ryu can't make sense of the words. He thinks there's some kind of error in the machine, but his opponent is gone. The S Gundam breaks off, with Josh evading Ryu's target lock as he escapes. Josh himself can't seem to figure out his opponent. 
The way he's moving, he can't tell if he's a rookie or some idiot in the pilot seat. The S Gundam, with the system glitching and Ryu trying to fight the system for control, still gives chase to his opponent, if ever clumsily. With the Gundam getting chase, Josh begins to get anxious. This plan to attack the Federation troops this way. It's a diversion, and time is running short. He's leading both squadrons in this fight, but their job is just to hold a line for only a few moments, but most importantly, make it look like the new decides intend to fight to the last man. After this engagement, their job was to escape to the fleet, which had already launched moments ago. Throughout this entire battle, Tosh Kray himself has been given another objective, to eliminate the traitors within their ranks, those who follow Drake. He'd been showing signs of weakness and a desire to run away and defect. With this battle, it's the perfect opportunity to eliminate a loose end for them. We cut back to Josh and the two Zeta Pluses that are pursuing him. Josh had been warned about these mass production units from what Tosh managed to see in the battle for Seoul. Over in Ryu's cockpit, seems Tex West has broken away from the main attack group along with his wingman to support Ryu. Ryu, knowing he'd broken formation to pursue an enemy, attempts to feign ignorance, telling Tex that if they wanted to help him, they should have come earlier. With the Zeta Pluses transforming and regrouping with Ryu, Tex yells at him in anger. They turn around, and it seems during Ryu's entire escapade, the enemy has begun to escape. They watch from below the battle as the new decides fleet begins to flee. They're breaking off and bolting away from the asteroid at maximum speed. Tex sends a laser message to Mannings. The enemy is escaping, with Mannings himself studying the layout of their formation and the trajectories of their ships. He can already tell what it is that Tosh Kray has done, and he informs Heathrow immediately and a laser message returns to the others, with Crip's Faz Trio just reaching the outside of the Paysoon perimeter as the warning sounds throughout the entire fleet. It's a trap. The attack is being called off and all forces are to withdraw from Paysoon immediately. The enemy is not at Paysoon. I repeat, the asteroid is a trap. As Crypt arrives at the outer perimeter of the base, he receives the message, himself being bummed out that he didn't get a chance to destroy anything, him not knowing what lies for them at the asteroid itself. We then cut back to Heathrow, who's attempting to communicate with the Lunar Fleet as attacking the asteroid from the other side, but something strange is happening to them. A new Decides cruiser, which had been transmitting a ceasefire signal to them, had two of its escort Zeku Ains open fire on the fleet. The Lunar Forces immediately immediately destroyed the ship in retaliation, but the escort suits immediately fled afterwards. These two mobile suits were the ones that Ryu encountered in his pursuit. Seems Tosh and Josh managed to lure Drake into their little trap. They can't be having him squealing to the enemy about their little surprise, but it seems that their enemies are already catching on to it. Over on the main cruiser, Brave Cod says it's pointless now. If they use it now, they'd only be hurting themselves. Their forces are still withdrawing and the blast wouldn't yield the tactical results that Brave would want. Destroying the base now would no longer mean anything now that they've fled, but Tosh puts a hand on his shoulder now that he's returned. No. It's not meaningless. If they do it now, they'll be able to display their entire ideology to the rest of the world and lead their forces to their new promised land. Brave now gets it. They will do it to show the wretched space noids that the new decides are taking Earth back. With the ships fleeing and the new decides escaping, Brave Cod bows to the crew of his cruiser, pressing the activation switch on board his own ship. With a single push of a button, Paizun ignites. The secret inside Paizun that had been hiding since the One Year War is finally revealed in this moment. The reason the asteroid was so special, why it had its own mobile suit development facilities, why it had so many different and unique weapons defending it back in its time. Heizun had been hiding one of Xeon's nuclear weapon vaults, sitting still since the day of the Antarctic Treaty signing. With that single press of a button, a single warhead self-destructs the entire base. The game of the new decides is finally revealed with this act. Azun explodes within the blink of an eye, the flash being visible from the bridge of every ship within its vicinity, the flash blinding everyone in the searing light of nuclear fire, and turning the entire asteroid of Pazun into a sea of stardust. So, let's take a break. Let's talk about this. Yeah, the new decides are a problem, and Tosh Cray, he's the one really running the show it seems. Brave might be the stoic face of it all, but Tosh 
is absolutely the true hidden hand of our villains. And now it seems the new decides have revealed one of their most dangerous cards. They've had access to nuclear weapons this whole time. I'm not going to say much else for now, but this is actually the point where the story of Gundam Sentinel goes into the territory most fans aren't familiar with, that first territory being Air City. You see, when it comes to the moon in Gundam, most people are familiar with the two main cities located on each of Luna's hemispheres, those being Von Braun and Granada. Each location on the moon holds a very special significance within the lore. For example, Von Braun is the largest of the lunar cities, and its center sits right at the spot where the first astronauts landed on the moon. Granada is the second largest and is located on the opposite half of the moon, and has close ties to Xeon, as it is also the furthest city away from the Earth, as their citizens sided with them during the One Year War, and because of this, have supplied the remnants of Xeon with loads of resources over the years. However, one of the new locations that Sentinel introduces is Ayer City, one of the oldest cities on the moon. Originally, Air City was nothing more than the location of a large stellar observation facility, but as the Earth's sphere expanded, an entire city sprouted from the facility's center. Due to its position on the surface of the moon, the citizens of Ayers rarely ever got a chance to glimpse up at the Earth, and to this day, the people of Ayers all hope to return there someday. So, when the Titans began to rise to power, the inhabitants of this city chose an interesting side of the conflict one that didn't seem to favor the space noids that the citizens of Luna were often known to side with. When the battles for grips broke out, and colonies were being destroyed left and right in the crossfire from the usage of their colony laser, Air City hunkered down and began to shore up their own defenses. The citizens of Ayers believe it is their duty to defend Mother Earth, and so they naturally sided with the Titans. Air City now acts as both a haven for the Titans' remnants and acts as a crucial resupply base for them that lies miles away from the center battlefield. However, we all know the fate of the Titans in that oh-so-crucial conflict. In the introductory blurb from the beginning of Chapter 5, we're introduced to the mayor of Air City, a man by the name of Kaiser Pinefield. The man has provided the whole of the Titans' remnants with a bastion for them to call their new home. When the first Titan survivors of the Griff's War came to Ayers, he granted them automatic citizenship, and used the autonomy of Ayers as an independent lunar city to bar the Federation from extraditing them. The man has a deep respect for the Titans and their mission, and sees the Federation as it is now as nothing more than the Ayuk's puppet. Along with him, working in the shadows, is another man, an individual who I briefly mentioned earlier, this being Satomi. This man is an intelligence agent, a key ally to the plans of the New Decides, one that Tosh Kray has recruited specifically for his skills. Shortly before the Paisun Revolt, Tosh had sent him to begin making contact with those who the New Decides are allies with now, Ayano and the citizens of Air City. We are introduced to this agent as he sits and gazes at the stars from one of Air City's large observation towers. But surprisingly, he's not just blindly staring off into space or looking at the Earth. He's actually looking out in the direction of Side 3. Someday, the Motherland will regain its glory, he murmurs to himself. You see, Sutomi is in reality a double agent. During the One Year War, he'd managed to fake records within the Federation military and change his identity. The Federation believes he's a soldier from a unit that was all wiped out, but in reality, he's simply using that as his cover story. In truth, he's really an agent of Neo Zeon for the rising malevolent storm that is Haman Karn. He leaves the observatory to once again enter the city, for even though he's not from this place, he blends right in with the crowd. After this long introduction, we're taken back once more to Task Force Alpha, following the destruction of the Pezun asteroid. Out of the two fleets, the lunar forces sent to aid them from the opposite side were the most heavily damaged by the nuclear explosion. The lunar fleet has been forced to head to Side 2 for emergency repairs and resupplying. With nothing else to do, Task Force Alpha has been ordered to pursue the new decides. Once the enemy's destination is located, another two reserve fleets will come to join them. It is now March 10th of Universal Century 0088, and one week ago, Judo Ashta stumbled across the Zeta Gundam. We are now entering the events of Sentinel that coincide with the events of Gundam.
Gundam Double Zeta. We cut to Commander Heathrow. He's sitting in his cabin, examining his chessboard. He can't seem to figure out where they're heading. Why sacrifice the asteroid? Did they really just do it to help with the escape? And if so, where are they heading to now? If that's the case, where's the Aeano fleet? They're still out there, but they haven't made their presence known yet. They could appear at any point in time to ambush them. As Heathrow contemplates his next moves, Manning's requests to enter. As he enters, Heathrow sits him down. The man seems tense. Manning says that he knows one of the people within the new decides. Heathrow is interested. Perhaps learning about their opponents would help to better understand them. He offers him a drink, but Manning's refuses. So, Heathrow asks bluntly, Who is it that you know? Manning's then goes a little more deeply into his own experiences with Tosh Cray. During the One Year War, Stone Manning's and Tosh Cray were part of the same unit. However, Taj was always considered unusual. He had an extremely brilliant mind. However, it never made any sense to anyone why it was that he chose to be a mobile suit pilot for someone who was so tactically talented and mentally capable. Tosh had aims of his own. Once he'd talked about a few times in the past, one day, he'd like to try and create his own nation. Heathrow asks if he had goals of governing a space colony, but Manning says his aims were much bigger. Manning's read articles Tosh wrote in school. The way he saw the world was an interesting one. To Tosh, the space colonies, the ones that float around the Earth, aren't true space colonies in his eyes. They're just small island-like cities that orbit the planet. If humanity wants to truly live a better life amongst the stars, then it has to best start terraforming other planets. To Taj Cray, only other planets have the rights to declare themselves as independent from Earth. The Seven Sides don't have the economic power to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with an entire planet. Heathrow, hearing this, somewhat agrees with that sentiment. The colonies either produce small amounts of energy or harvest small amounts of minerals for Earth. They wouldn't really change anything for the planet. They'd only be hurting themselves if they tried to cut themselves off from Earth. But Mannings asks him to get to the point. Judging from this information about Tosh that he has given him, Mannings can already tell where it is the new decides are starting to head next. The moon. Heathrow himself had made that guess as well, but he wasn't sure himself. But now that he understands this little bit about their opponents, he agrees. The new decides are a very different anti-Federation force. They're against the seven sides, and no one else. However, they have another hidden piece on the board. Mannings asks what he means, and Heathrow explains that ever since Commander Ayano betrayed the Federation, and the Lunar Fleet came to aid them, the Moon has been left entirely defenseless. Additionally, the Federation has begun to suffer losses at Side 4, meaning the new Decides have a direct line to begin rallying their forces. And with Neo Zeon beginning their invasion right now, Side 3 will be unable to send help their way with the Federation forces currently occupied there. The conversation ends with Heathrow asking Mannings, can you tell me some more about our opponent? What's this man's name, for example? Tosh. Tosh Cray. We're cut to the Aeono fleet. The new decides have escaped to the moon's southern hemisphere. Aeono's fleet themselves have made it to the dark side of the moon, doing repairs to their ships as they prepare to form up with their new allies. They'd engaged with the Federation forces at Side 4, clearing a path to the new decides as their forces were beginning to rally to Air City. For now, they rest amongst the colony debris, doing what repairs that they can. Unfortunately, they did lose two valuable ships during the fighting, and due to their location, they have no clue about what's happening on the outside. All they know is that their job is to form up with the new decides on the moon. However, the first message they're able to receive is not a very good one. Heizun has been destroyed. Ayano asks if the Federation forces did it, but it seems from the readouts that the blast was caused by the new decides. They triggered some kind of self-destruct within the asteroid and used it to escape. He orders his crew that they establish contact immediately. However, Minovsky particle interference is high at the moment. Laser comms is the only option they have right now. With Ayano knowing that the new decides are heading to the moon, he orders the repairs to their ships and increase in haste. But as he closes his comm channel to the rest of the crew, he ponders. He wonders if the new decides have even found out he's defected to their side. He worries and hopes that this whole situation won't lead to any further infighting amongst their allies. We come to two days later, and the new decides are nearing closer to Luna. You see, the new decides in this moment aren't aware that Luna is undefended, and thus think that the Lunar Defense Fleet is still waiting for them. The crew on board their flagship are all undergoing maintenance to their mobile suits, and even Brave Cod himself is readying himself for whatever battle is awaiting them. Brave asks Tosh Cray how the preparations 
units are coming along, and it seems all of their assault groups are ready to go. Rave himself, though, asks if the Zeku Ainz in front of them has been tuned up for him, and Cray himself jokingly wonders if Brave plans to go off into battle himself. He hasn't really been out of the controls of a mobile suit in a long time. Is he itching to get out there too? Brave asks if Tosh can really tell, and the man jokingly says that it's all written all over his face. But in all honesty, it may not be a good idea. He is their leader. They can't suffer any more losses at such a crucial juncture. Brave asks if Tosh really thinks those idiots in the AU Grun Federation really stand a chance at beating him. But Tosh reiterates that what he fears is Brave's attitude towards all this. He seems to always be the kind of person who disregards his position position to go get into fights. Brave says, though, that he really doesn't like being the leader. He's never been the type of man. Tosh himself has always been more suited to commanding people than him. But Tosh eases him. Don't be ridiculous. You're much better at putting words into action. It's what they need most. People who can get stuff done. It's an easy thing to get smart people together, but getting them to do things, that's where Brave's talents really lie. He shouldn't have to waste his time with eliminating such insignificant threats himself. As the two talk, a message comes for Brave. They've made it. They've arrived at the moon. Brave finds it strange, though. They haven't caught wind of the Lunar Defense Fleet. As the fleet enters Luna's atmosphere, they receive a crackled message over one of their comm channels. They can't tell what it is, though. The message keeps changing frequencies. As they attempt to establish comms, they receive it, a text message over the laser receiver. We no longer recognize the authority of the Earth Federation forces, for we only believe in the just cause of the new decides. Please allow us to join your forces in battle. They're all frozen. Ayano, he's joining forces with them. Satomi's mission was a success. They have allies. It all comes as a huge surprise. Even Tosh himself is smiling at the news. With a simple outward message, the Kilimanjaro requests to land. They've made it to Ayers City. Over in the control tower, the weary operators are surprisingly greeted by Mayor Pinefield, who hurriedly patch him through to the bridge of the ship. The video feed on the monitor shows them brave. It's been a tough journey for you, it seems. Kaiser says to Brave, but Brave says that Air City are the real ones in a tough spot. He's just glad to have their help with all this. However, Mayor Pinefield reassures him, there's no need for formalities. They're all comrades here. No, they're family. Satomi has told them all about the plan, and he believes it's the least he could do for not being able to help sooner. The people of Ayers didn't exactly enjoy being forced to fight in the Grips War, and the fact they were forced to retreat is seen by many of them as a disgrace. But knowing that the new decides were in trouble and that they needed help was the best way to make amends in their eyes. He's impressed with their fleet, four large cruisers, but the combined forces they have here and the fleet that belongs to Iano, they definitely have a good chance at forming a strong military presence, with Cod himself being happy to see all of the ships that Ayers City has docked in its main starport, Titan's remnant vessels from all around, cruisers from the city's own militia fleet, everything they need to make a proper army. However, Tosh himself worries. Their fleet is composed of some pretty outdated ships. Their forces aren't exactly state-of-the-art, but Brave reassures him that it's perfect. But wins wars isn't weapons, but strategies. This reminds him of Ayano. He heard a rumor that he'd been bringing along with him some kind of state-of-the-art weapon with him. Once they use it, any doubts that they can't win will absolutely vanish. And with a strategic and impactful victory like what is about to happen, their dream might finally come true. Their dream to create a Lunar City Coalition. Tosh can tell that Brave still has the drive to go fight and battle himself, but it seems at this point he can't really stop him. Brave then gets excited. He says he himself can't wait. He wants to try out that new weapon that Ayano is bringing with him. An excellently designed mobile suit. One that, when paired with an equally exceptional pilot, will be able to completely change the battlefield in an instant. Just like the legendary Amuro Ray, Brave Cod aims to do the same with this mobile suit. Over with Task Force Alpha, who received word that allies are, are on their way from Penta, they learn that the new decides have entered into Luna's orbit, but their reinforcements won't make it to the moon for at least another two days. That left one more fleet within their vicinity, Pompeii Island, the former Xeon asteroid base of Solomon. Unfortunately, though, this this force has had its own issues. With Neo Zeon now on the rise, their forces will be able to help, but it won't be for very long, as Solomon is currently just close enough for the fleet stationed there to aid them for the time being while they shore up their defenses. He throw orders that Mannings be called to the bridge, along with all Mobile Suit Squadron leaders. Their only chance is to eliminate the new Decide's forces before they can have a chance to organize themselves. Once in the briefing room, Mannings begins to give them their current plan. Currently, Task Force Alpha is in pursuit of the new Decide. 
sides. However, at their current speed, they're about a day's distance from one another. They're now within Ayer's city, and the only chance they currently stand is with a plan for a surprise attack. If they're fast enough, they'll catch them off guard before they can set up a defensive network around the city. The only forces they'd have to worry about would be the new decides fleet, mobile suit complement, and the city's own militia forces. The key objective of this mission will be to establish a beachhead and landing position for their forces to use so they can breach the city. But as Mannings explains, all the other pilots can't help but laugh. Chung asks about Ayano. What about the defecting fleet that's allied themselves with the new decides? Has he seriously forgotten about them? What if they made contact with the new decides? But Mannings reassures them. They know that the defector's original plan was to regroup at Peizun. With the S Gundam destroying their solar collector satellite and the asteroid now being destroyed, this whole situation has changed their plans. Ayano's forces engaged the Federation at Side 4, so they'd had to have had made repairs before heading to the moon. So, in all likelihood, they're most likely a whole day behind them. The other pilots soon feel a bit more relieved with him saying that, but Mannings then goes over the options they've been presented with. Yes, if they want to meet up with the reinforcements from Penta, their mission should be to deal with Ayano. But with the threats posed by both of these fleets, and with both of these threats being of relatively equal strength, their focus should be on the new decides. Reduce their threat before the two sides can form together. But Ryu, sitting on the meeting, rolls his eyes. It doesn't matter which force they choose to deal with, they're still going to be ordered to go be the first ones to die. Chung himself gets mad. So what? There are your orders. If he tells you to die, you do it. But Ryu can't stand that. So now our own deaths have to be governed by orders? That's ridiculous. But Manning says he's a soldier. He joined their military, and he's a part of them. He has to follow the rules. But Ryu still can't abide by that. That's such an archaic thing to say. If he wants to go die, then go die. He doesn't care, with Mannings giving him a cold, glaring stare, but then seeing that another fight is about to go down inside this briefing room, he then reiterates, Easy now. He's not going to be ordering them to their deaths. He will never do that. However, this will be their objective. Ryu and the S Gundam, along with the Zeta Pluses and the Fazes, will deal with the enemy ships at airs. The rest will have the job of intercepting any mobile suit forces they have that get sent their way. The mission will begin tomorrow, on Friday the 13th, and when we switch over to the next scene, we get to see just how unlucky this day will be for them. We cut to later that day, and Ayano and the new decides have already formed up. Task Force Alpha is going to be completely underprepared for the combined force they are about to engage. Ayano's fleet arrives within the Air City spaceport, and the entire fleet has all of its carriers loaded to the brim with dozens of GMs. At the bridge of the Kilimanjaro, the crew watches excitedly as the two fleets greet each other. It's been a long time, Captain Cod, says Ayano. Last they met, it was during the One Year War. I brought you and all your forces a gift, the much rumored new weapon. We cut to the start of Task Force Alpha's mission. The operation begins. All of their mobile suit forces launch into battle. Nearly 45 mobile suits in total from the entire fleet launch, with one third of them staying behind to defend the fleet itself. All of them not knowing that they're about to be ambushed and their attack is about to fail. First signs hit them once they reach the outer city. The 112th Assault Force's lead Nero mobile suit unit explodes as their three squadrons are cut to pieces from two sides. The Nero pilots panic. It's an ambush! Two more Neros explode, with each member one by one being cut to pieces as they transmit the distress call to the fleet. As the wreckage drifts about the lunar surface, a mobile suit emerges from the flaming debris. Massive, blue, with white stripes painted about its whole body, an angular face, and a hulking frame. This mobile suit is the Gundam Mark V. Two round incom units retract into its backpack. With a smirk on his face, and a lick of his lips, Brave Cod smiles as he relishes in the power of his new machine. We cut to Task Force Alpha, and they get the message. The 112th Mobile Suit Company was entirely decimated. As they see the IFF code disappear from their monitors, they all wonder, were they ambushed? Don't tell me they managed to set up their defense systems already. Heathrow now realizes it. If it were only the militia forces, then it would have been just a large force of GMs, but even those wouldn't have been enough to stop them. Then it hits him. There's only one explanation. Ayano. He orders that their forces change routes immediately, but it's too late. They were ordered to maintain radio silence in preparation for the ambush. The realization makes Heathrow turn pale. They've been played. 
Task Force Alpha is now trapped. All of their forces are now in a massive kill box with no way out. Alrighty, and that is the end of Sentinel Part 2. No analysis this time. This whole part has just been built up for all the crazy stuff that's about to happen in the next part. I have to admit, the destruction of Paizoon really came as a surprise that it occurred this early in the story. And with the possibility of Neo Zeon slowly making their own plays in this conflict, it makes me very excited for what it is that's happening next. Once again, thank you for watching this video. I'm sorry if this video took a long time to come out. A lot of things have been happening outside of YouTube, and I just haven't been able to get back into writing my scripts for this. Don't worry though, all things are good, but once again, and this video series might take a little longer to cover than most. Anyways, that'll be it for this video. Tune in next time where we go into Gundam Sentinel Part 3 and the Battle for Air City. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, turn on the notification bell to make sure you're caught up with the story, and this is Guy Guys, signing off. Bye!